Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of QRS TV. Today, we are going to continue our journey on rhythm diagnosis, and I'm going to share an ECG with you that I think is pretty cool. It's from a 13-year-old female spade Pomeranian, and she was being evaluated for the presence of a heart murmur. We have a six-lead frontal plane lead ECG in front of us here, and we're going to work through all of our steps to try to arrive at a rhythm diagnosis. And so just to review our steps, we're going to think about heart rate, rhythm, we're going to search for P's and QRS's and the association between those. And we're going to try to discern if some or all of this is, is a sinus rhythm. So if you start with heart rate, I know that the rate is changing, just visualizing it. I can see it's speeding up and slowing down. So I made myself a six second ruler between the arrows. And if I count the heartbeats within that six second ruler, I get an average heart rate of 150. So that's one way I could approach heart rate. I could also still do an instantaneous heart rate. If I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna select a long cycle and a short cycle to give myself a range. And when I do that using the 300 rule, I get between 125 and 170. So that gives me an idea of instantaneous range. So I know I'm dealing with a patient with a normal to slightly elevated heart rate here. My next question is whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. And I can tell that it's irregular. However, it's phasic. So irregular meaning the distance between the QRS complexes is not staying um, the same, it is changing, but it's doing so in a phasic pattern. So to my eye, it's kind of speeding up and slowing down in a phasic way. Is there a P wave for every QRS? I do think there is. So there is a, a small positive deflection in front of each of those QRS complexes. And similarly, there is a QRS for every P wave. So I don't have any lone or isolated P waves, nor do I have any lone or isolated QRS complexes. As to whether all the P waves are the same, that's where things get interesting. Uh, they're not all the same. And I've identified sort of two populations here. Um, we have some that look smaller or short, uh, shorter, and others that look taller. So there's definitely two populations here. And I'm already starting to think, well, is that because they're arising from different locations? Or are they perhaps taking a different pathway through the atria, or a bit of both? So those are things that are going through my mind as I approach this. Are the QRS complexes all the same? I, I do think they are. So they are all narrow and superventricular looking, normal looking. So that's a yes for me. Is the PR interval constant? I do think it is. So it, it looks like those P's and QRS's have a consistent relationship, even though the P's are, are changing morphology. And that's important again, because we're, we're seeing that the atrial activity resulted in the ventricular activity. Uh, and those things are indeed associated. And are the P's positive in lead two? They all are, even though the P waves are, are changing. So I'm going to come back to, you know, this, this concept of the P waves not being all the same, because we've answered yes to, to everything else in terms of criteria that might fit a sinus rhythm. And so is all of this sinus rhythm or is only part of it sinus rhythm? Well, again, if we come back to this idea of these different um, P wave morphologies, I'm thinking, are they all arising from the SA node, but just taking maybe a slightly different pathway through the atria to result in the different look? Or are they indeed ectopics? Are some of these P waves truly not arising from the SA node and coming from somewhere else, an ectopic site within the atria? And that's where some knowledge about the SA node comes handy. So let me share a little bit of that with you. So here we have a histologic um, section of the canine SA node. And the main thing I want to share with you here is that it's, it's actually a fairly expansive structure. So it's the, this banana or cigar shaped thing that is outlined by the dashed black line. And we can see from the scale in the lower right corner that um, the canine SA node actually ranges between about two to five um, millimeters in width and 10 to 30 millimeters or one to three centimeters in length. Uh, so it can be a sizable structure. And the depolarization can arise um, from various locations within this structure and break out into the atria from various locations. Although there is sort of a preferential activation site, which is denoted by that green star. So that's where um, the depolarization preferentially breaks out into the atria, but there are other conduction pathways that are possible. And in fact, if we look at this schematic here, um, we've sort of superimposed that cigar or banana shaped uh, SA node into a schematic of the heart, that red structure. And if we think about left and right, 
um, labels of the, of the sides of the heart. And if we think about lead two's perspective, so that's my eyeball. Lead two's perspective is from the left hind limb, that's the positive pole. And so I've sort of positioned the eyeball on the left side um, caudally where um, lead two might be looking, if you will. And if we imagine a depolarization that breaks out of that SA node structure fairly dorsally, um, like where the green star is in that diagram, and then washes across the atria, it might produce a vector that is denoted by my purple arrow there that is um, directed pretty straight towards that eyeball. And that's what's gonna give us those taller P waves versus what if the depolarization were to originate and break out of that SA nodal structure in a location that's slightly more ventral and wash across in a way that's still toward the eyeball, but not as directly toward the eyeball. So the, the slope of that vector has changed. Um, that could produce some P waves that are still positive, but maybe not as tall. And that's exactly what is happening in the setting of sinus arrhythmia in some cases, where the, the site of origin of that sinoatrial nodal depolarization is shifting from a more dorsal location when sympathetic tone is dominant during inspiration and a more sort of uh, ventral or lower location when parasympathetic tone is more dominant when the heart rate slows. So if we look back at it, our ECG, again, we get the smaller P waves when the heart rate is slower during that parasympathetic um, component. And then we get the taller P waves um, when the heart rate is, is sort of faster, um, albeit still in a gradual phasic sort of way. And so my interpretation of this was that this could still be a fairly dramatic sinus arrhythmia, normal rhythm, um, with what we call a wandering atrial pacemaker, which actually can be a normal finding in the setting of sinus arrhythmia. So look out for this finding. Um, now you know how to approach it. And we'll contrast that with something a little bit different in our, our next episode. Thanks for joining. See you again.